The Old Testament today comes from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of all meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, If there is an excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise now for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the jobs that the Old Testament prophets have is to to show us, as they tell us, over and over again, the victory of God. That, That is, that in the end, God wins. And that's what Isaiah is doing in our text today from the 25th chapter of the book of Isaiah. That's what he's talking about when he talks about things like death being swallowed up forever. When he talks about he himself wiping away the tears from our very faces. And the purpose of Isaiah telling us this and of all the prophets reminding us of these great truths is simply to say, look, don't give up your faith in God's reality, in God's presence for you, in God's power in God's promises for you. What we're being told is that any prayer that is prayed in faith is never prayed in vain. Any promise of God that you believe is never believed in vain. No life lived in obedience to God is ever wasted. No suffering that you might endure, no matter how great or small, is ever endured in a meaningless way. Because in the end, the victory is God's. And those who rest in God, those who trust in His power, promises, presence, reality for them, they get to share 
in that victory. So it's not just his victory, but it is his victory that we also participate in. Now, in the verses that we looked at today from the 25th chapter, this victory is especially pictured for us, as our own Paul just mentioned, as a feast, as a kind of banquet, a party, and a feast that takes place on a particular mountain. Now, the mountain that is being talked about there geographically, you might say, is Mount Zion, that mountain in Jerusalem that the temple had been built on, the temple in the Old Testament, which was the center of God's presence and his promises and his activity in the world. But ultimately, what the mountain is really telling us about is the new heaven and the new earth, the new creation when Christ comes again and we will truly be in perfect fellowship with him forever. It's pictured for us again as this great feast. And verse 6 talks about the menu for this feast. It talks about the, the best meats. It talks about the finest wines. And the point there for us is that only God is able to quench our deepest thirsts. Only God can satisfy our very deepest hungers. He is the one who satisfies and blesses mankind. And that's not just true for some day in the future when Christ finally comes again and the victory is obvious and evident to all. What it's really saying for us right now is it is already true for us. Even though we don't experience that satisfaction in the way that we will when Christ comes again, already God is giving us saving truth that is substantial and filling. It satisfies us unlike the empty and disappointing philosophies of the world in which we live. God is giving us something, something satisfying something that, that really will give us life, just like food and, and good drink continues to, to nurture your body. But here's what happens, and this is really the story of Scripture, isn't it? That humanity doesn't want the feast that God provides. And that was the point that Jesus was making in the parable that we heard in Matthew chapter 22. Here's this king. And he has prepared this great banquet for the wedding of his son. And he sends out these invitations to, to, to people. They don't want to come. And they you know, give their excuses. You know, here's, here's why I'm not coming. And did you notice how like our own excuses their excuses were? This sense of, well, I've got some other things I've got to take care of. I've got some business on hand, you know, I've got family matters, whatever it is. These excuses that we come up with at times, you can think back to moments in your life when, when the things of God were not as precious to you as they ought to have been, and you made your excuses, if you will. And so how like us, uh, the, the folks in the parable are. Or, or have you ever had this experience? You, you surely have if you're a parent, trying to get a young child who's only interested in things like Cheetos and, and French fries and chicken nuggets to, you know, to, to want to sink their teeth into something actually good for them. And not just good for them, but something that actually tastes good. You know, you've got some great spread and, and, you know, maybe it's steak or maybe it is like a Thanksgiving meal and, and you know, they would be even more delighted if you'd give them a happy meal. Well, why is that? Well, because we're more satisfied with junk food than we are with this veritable feast that God provides. And that's the kind of thing that Isaiah and so much of Scripture is trying to reinforce in our thoughts, that, that we, we have the wrong appetites. And the only way that we can actually enjoy that which God provides is somehow for the ignorance and the sin and the spiritual immaturity and the spiritual darkness that otherwise satisfies us to be removed but then replaced with deeper longings that God satisfies. Verses 2 and 3 were not a part of our reading. They're certainly a part of, of the, the discussion that Isaiah is having in this particular chapter. And what those verses are talking about is how it is that God goes about changing our longings. How does God work in our lives so that our desires begin to match what he himself provides? Listen to what it says. 
Isaiah speaking here to God, he says, you have made the city a heap of rubble, the fortified town a ruin, the foreigner's stronghold you've made a city no more, it will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will honor you. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. Now notice what, what those verses are doing. They are picturing for us a, a circumstance, a situation where people feel safe, and it's doing it in terms of, of city walls. So you think, you know, if you lived back in ancient times and you lived in a city that had good, tall, well-fortified, thick walls, you would feel safe inside that city. But what about if the walls were torn down? What would give you safety then? So that's the kind of thing that Isaiah is having us think about so that we would ask questions like, well, what are the walls in my life behind which I take refuge and behind which I feel safe? And, and what are those walls behind which I take refuge which are not actually walls that can keep me safe. So think about those times in your life where, where you're feeling safe and secure. Maybe it's uh, when the economy is, is moving along and doing well. Maybe it's when you're not having any health crises in your life and, and you're, you're feeling fit and, and, and strong. Maybe when in your interactions with people around you, what's happening is you're being accepted and you're being appreciated by those folks who, whose, whose acceptance of you is important to you. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. Those are all actually things that, that do add to our sense of blessing. But sometimes what happens is we confuse the blessing itself with the one who provides them. So what happens when the crisis comes along? What about when the economy, when, when your personal finances are, are not doing so well? What about when you get bad news from the doctor about your health or about the health of someone you love, someone who you depend on? What about when your relationships begin to break down and the people whose approval you desire, you're not getting that approval. They don't accept you, they don't love you, they don't appreciate you. See, when the crisis comes, that's when we begin to find out where am I actually resting my, my confidence in? Because if when those things are taken away from me, if all of a sudden my, my life falls apart, what I'm finding out is I'm actually not resting in God himself. The crisis shows me what I depend on. And what God is saying about everything in our lives that, that we might depend on that is not him, what he's saying is, look, the day is coming when your walls are going to be a heap of rubble. And then what? Well, look what he says next, and, and we looked at this verse already, this, this third verse. Look what happens when the walls, when the weak defenses that we depend upon actually do come down. Verse 3 indicates that then those who were once strong in themselves begin instead to revere God. That when the, when the ruthless and the self-sufficient have those, those fortifications torn down, then what happens is they begin to honor God instead of themselves. What that passage is actually talking about, it, it's an application of Psalm 119, which says this, the psalmist says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. He says it was good for me to be afflicted, that I might learn your decrees. Haven't you found that to be oftentimes the case in your life? when you were depending on the wrong things, when you were not resting in God in the way that God invites us to, and then some crisis did emerge in your life, all of a sudden you realize, you know what? God's the one I need. And then you began to, to look to Him. And so this is really the story of Christian repentance and confession of sin and faith. God is revealing to us our lack of love and trust in Him, our sinfulness in all kinds of ways. He exposes the weakness of those things that we once took pride in. And having torn down the walls, then what He does is He transforms us into those who truly rest in and rely upon Him, the one who is the source of our life and our eternal life. And in doing this, verse, uh, verse 8, this 
part of our text, says this. It says that then God will remove the disgrace of his people. The disgrace, the, the shame. Christianity Today had an article that mentioned a, an author and a lecturer whose name might be familiar to you. This is kind of a new one uh, to me, but I found out that actually she's quite well known. A woman by the name of Brene Brown. And she especially became a, a, a name that people were interested in about nine years ago when she gave a TED Talk, if you're familiar with it what TED Talks are, uh, you can go on YouTube and you can find this particular talk that she gave about 20 minutes long. And if you look at it, you'll notice on YouTube that this, this lecture, if we want to call it that, has 14 million views. Now, if, if, you, if you do a talk and you get 14 million views on YouTube, you know what that tells you? You have hit on something that people are thinking about something that people are talking about and something that, that, that very much affects their lives. And what she talks about is shame and vulnerability. That's what she's very well known for. And she, she says, for instance, things like this, that what shame does in us is it plays these recordings in our mind, recordings that are different versions of you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not popular enough, you're not uh, thin enough, you're not strong enough, you're not successful. It just keeps re re repeating these kinds of lines in our head. And, and maybe you can think of those areas in your life where you hear those kinds of things, you know, that give you a sense of shame in your life. And, and she warns that the, the danger of shame is that it's, that it's lethal and it's destructive to us as persons. And she's absolutely right. If you've ever lived with a sense of shame, if you ever struggled with a sense of shame, and you felt like you, you couldn't get that burden off of you, you know how destructive it can really be to a sense of well-being and health. In fact, if it's not removed, people have literally taken their lives because of the weight of shame that they've carried. And so she says that, that we've got to get rid of it, got to get rid of shame. Christianity Today suggests that she may be going too far when she calls for us to eliminate shame from our experience altogether. The question they ask is, what about those areas in our life where we should feel shame? They give an example. If they give the example of Harvey Weinstein and other powerful men who abused women who came into their lives in, in different ways. And they ask the question, what made these men behave so monstrously? What made them think they could get away with it? And, and the answer suggested is, because they have no shame. They didn't have any shame. Why do they have any shame? Well, a part of the answer to that is because we actually live in a culture that says, you know what? We've got to eliminate shame from our lives altogether. And so, so what happens is people say, I've got to get rid of shame. I'm not going to experience shame. I'm going to do everything to, to put my shame behind me. But then what happens is, instead of actually truly removing shame, what we just act in more and more shameful ways. I want to go back to, to what she has said that shame is destructive, shame is lethal. We've got to eliminate it. There is a truth to that. Here's the problem. The way it's actually removed. See, the Bible tells us the same story. The Bible also tells us that shame is destructive and deadly. And the Bible tells us that, that shame must be removed or it will, in the end, destroy us. But what the Bible tells us is, we can't simply get rid of it ourselves. But God must himself rescue us from it. A couple other things about shame. You realize there's, there's two kinds of shame. And we're all familiar with both kinds to one degree or the other. One kind of shame is the shame that we bring on ourselves because we've done shame things at various times. Those things that we don't like to remember things in your life, when you do remember it, well, it makes you ashamed. It kind of even might bring, a, bring color to your face 
to think about things that you've said and that you've done. So that's one kind of shame. We've acted shamefully. There's another kind of shame. And it's just as powerful, in some ways even more powerful. It's when we've been treated shamefully by someone else. When we've been sinned against. One of the most horrible and tragically one of the most common examples of that would, for instance, be when a little child is molested or abused in some way. And when that person carries all throughout their life a deep sense of shame, not because of something that they've done, but because of something that's been done to them because someone else felt no shame. Do you realize that, that God's plan of rescue rescues us from both kinds of shame? The shame that we carry because of our own sinfulness, but then on top of that, this is important, the shame that we experience because other people have sinned against us. Think about Jesus hanging on the cross. What a shameful place for the most innocent human being that ever lived to be. Stripped of his clothing, mocked by people passing by, shamed in the worst kind of way. Do you realize that in that moment as he hung on the cross, that he was bearing literally the shame of the world, the shame of our own sinfulness, but also the shame that's been imposed on us. So that as we acknowledge the shame that is right there in our lives, that we feel we can say, wait a minute, Someone carried that for me. It doesn't mean that we never feel a sense of shame, but it does mean this, that when we experience it, when it begins to destroy us, we have somewhere to go with it. We can say, I don't have to carry it anymore because Jesus carried it in my place. In fact, death itself, the greatest shame of all has been dealt with in Jesus. You know, many of you, probably not all of you, but many of you have actually been in the room when someone that you love has died. And if you have been, you could probably realize that there's a truth in this, that there's, there's nothing very dignified about death. We do our best to treat one who we love who is dying with dignity, and we should, but death itself is, is completely undignified. Think about what's happening. The life of someone who has been made in the image of God is leaving that body. But here's what it says in our text, that God will swallow up death forever. Even that shame is taken away. And more than that, that God is going to wipe the tears from our very faces. This tender image of God acting the part of the Heavenly Father that He really is in our lives, here's what it's telling you that God is genuinely touched and concerned about those things in our lives that really do hurt us. And that in Christ, He has put into, into operation a plan that brings an end to it all. Backing up to the very first verse of this chapter, chapter 25, <clears throat> it says there, Lord, You are my God. I will exalt You and praise Your name for in perfect faithfulness you have done marvelous things, things planned long ago. Do you ever think about the fact that God is a planning God? Really, He plans things out from eternity, in fact. That there is eternal forethought in every single thing that God does, that God already knew from eternity everything that would take place in the history of the world, everything that has taken place in your life up till this very moment, and everything that ever will take place in your life. And that means that God is never ever caught off guard. God is never surprised by anything that happens in your life or mine or in the whole history of the world. God is never playing catch up. You know, if you're rooting for a football team and, and the team that you're rooting for is behind, and you get to the very end of the game, the last, you know, three seconds, let's say, and your team is still behind by two points, and in those last seconds, a 54-yard field goal is scored by your team, and you end up winning. Boy, isn't that, a, isn't that a wonder, and isn't that a victory? And doesn't that feel good, even though you weren't down on the field actually playing the game, and yet you participate in that victory? In God's case, the wonders 
and the victories are all planned. God plans to win, and He does. And what God has done to save your soul is backed by this certainty God planned it all long ago. And He has worked wonders to bring it out, the life and the death and the resurrection of His Son Christ Jesus for you. Therefore, in your life, you can be sure that your faith in His love for you, His forgiveness of your sin, it will never fail. You can be sure that your disgrace and your shame in life, whatever its source, it really has been removed. You can be confident His triumph is sure and that the victory feast has already been prepared and you have been invited in Christ. Amen. I invite you to rise. Now may this word keep you steadfast in the true faith until life everlasting. Amen. Let's continue by confessing our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. For the church, for the leaders of the church, for all pastors and missionaries, for those preparing for church vocations, and for those considering full-time church service, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the blessing of marriage and the faithfulness of husbands and wives, for the children entrusted to their care, for the loving care of children who have suffered abuse or neglect, and for those who open their homes to children in foster care, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a welcoming spirit in our congregation, for boldness in our invitation to those without a church home, and for a willingness to serve our neighbor in need, and the strangers whose lives cross our paths, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For compassion toward the sick and those who suffer, for our care of those who need our assistance, for the hospitalized and those recovering, especially for Larry Sump, Palmer Nolan, Marcia Wigert, Renee Batt, William Shirkle, Ella Mae Kimmel, Deb Smith, Jamie Klein, Brianna Hoffman, Lauren Streiner, Marilyn Walker, Jessica Steele and Luann, the family friend of the Hatfields, as well as those that we name in our hearts, that God may grant them healing, comfort, strength, and peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all elected and appointed civil servants, for all judges and magistrates, for all emergency personnel, for all members of the armed forces, and for all of us as citizens and neighbors, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our communion upon the body and blood of the Lord, for our hearts, burn with desire for the marriage feast of the Lamb and His kingdom without end, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those preparing for baptism, for the catechumens, for the places where we gather to teach and learn God's Word, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For gratitude in receiving the Lord's gifts and blessings, for generosity in sharing these resources with those in need, and for the tithes and offerings to support the work of the kingdom in this place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for those who mourn the death of Laverne Pogler, that they may be comforted in Christ. All these things, Lord, we pray you to grant us according to your mercy in Jesus Christ and to fill us with contentment that trusting in your gracious will for all things, our hearts may enjoy perfect rest and peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Good morning. Today in Philippians we read, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. What does it mean to rejoice? 
Well, rejoice means to remember with great joy, to celebrate, to throw a party. And we know how to do that. We're good at celebrating birthdays and, and holidays and big wins by our football teams, new babies. We know how to celebrate. And I can think of three things especially that we do when it's time to celebrate. One, food. A celebration needs food. For, for Thanksgiving and Christmas, we, we have turkeys and hams and mashed potatoes and, and all the fixings. People bring food. And especially we like desserts. For, for holidays, for, for birthdays especially, we like cake. Cake is a celebration food. And so that's one. Two, singing. We sing. We sing when we get together to celebrate. We sing Christmas carols at Christmas. We sing uh, happy birthday at birthday parties. We sing for he's a got jolly good fellow uh, at other parties. We sing to rejoice. And three, friends. We, we celebrate with friends. We need our buddies around. We need someone to celebrate with. We have family and, and friends and we call them together so that we can celebrate. That's the only way to celebrate. So today we're told to rejoice in the Lord always. So what does that look like? Well, it looks like coming to church. It looks like gathering together. Well, let's look. We've got food we, at the Lord's Supper. When we come to worship, we have the Lord's Supper. We have food. And, and so moms and dads and, and, and kids that are, are in confirmation, they'll celebrate with communion, with the, with the Lord's Supper. And, and you know what? You as kiddos, I know you're not getting the bread and the wine, but you get to come and be a part of it. You're invited to the table to come and celebrate the feast. So we have food when we come to church. Two, uh, we have songs. We sing hymns. We sing songs that remind us of God's love, of how he's loved and protected his people in the Bible and how he continues to love and protect you and me. So we come together and we raise a loud voice in singing. And three, friends. We gather together with the, the body of believers, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, as we celebrate what God has done for all of us. So we all come together and we celebrate together and worship. But one more question, why do we gather to celebrate? Why do we rejoice in the Lord always? Well, really because he rejoices in you and in me. Because for some reason, we, when he looks at you, when he looks at me, his heart fills with love and joy, and he rejoices, and he can't wait to spend eternity with you. Because right now, he is up in heaven preparing a place for you at the great eternal party, at the great feast. He's preparing a place for you and for me. So we gather and rejoice. Not because it's our job or because we have to, but because we're thinking about how God is rejoicing so much in each and every one of us. And we're looking forward to the day when we will be rejoicing with him in heaven. Let's pray. We pray, dear God, thank you for Jesus. Help us to look forward to the day we will party with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.